His vocabulary runs to several hundred words, and he can follow simple conversations. His name is Kenzie, and Kenzie is an ape. I'm going to help him get some sticks. Good. We need more sticks, too. I have a lighter in my pocket if you need one. Yes. You can get it out. I hope I have a lighter. You can use the lighter to start the fire. He may look like a chimpanzee, but Kanzi is a bonobo. A closely related species from the forested Congo region of Central Africa. Bonobos are highly intelligent and physically similar to human ancestors whose remains are found in this cradle of mankind, the great rift valley of East Africa. In the mid-70s, a three-and-a-half-million-year-old human skeleton was discovered in the Rift Valley. She was named Lucy for the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, which happened to be on the radio at the time. The hominid Lucy and bonobos like Kanzi share a remarkable number of features. Their limb proportions and the way in which they walk are similar. Which returns us to Kanzi, the bonobo who shares features with our own human ancestors. Working with Kanzi sheds light on our evolutionary path out of ancient East Africa to the full global sweep of the whole modern world. Georgia State University's Language Research Center, Kanzi's home, is set among 50 wooded acres just 20 minutes from downtown Atlanta. Researchers here study language development in human children by comparing it with language development in our close relatives, apes. Kanzi, working on word tests with Dr. Rose Sevchik. Kanzi is distinguishing spoken words. First, the researcher says a word. Balloon. Balloon, yes. To answer, Kanzi presses a picture symbol, which triggers an electronic voice. These 256 symbols bear no visual resemblance to test words, which include adjectives, verbs, even wishes and emotions. Potato. The board includes abstracts like good and bad. Some human adults working with Kanzi have taken a year to memorize these symbols and master the board. House. Rock. Rock. Good, Kanzi. Kanzi. Dr. Sue Savage-Rumbaugh is one of several people who care for Kanzi at the Language Research Center. 
They often prepare their meals together. Here's some cheese. You put that in your tummy. This is going to be for a hot food. Okay, I want you to go put the onions in your hot food. I got the onions in a bowl. Let's go put them in our hot food and we'll come back and turn the TV on. Get your onions right here and put them in your bowl. Look, you spill some of them. Savage Rumbau has monitored Kenzie's language development since soon after his birth, 13 years ago. Let me get you a spoon to start with, Kenzie. Go stir it up, please. Yeah. Will you wash this potato off for me? Could you wash the potato? With the water. You need to wash it in the water. That's very good. Put some water in the pan for our noodles. More water. More water. All right, your noodles are going to go in here, and you can have a few of them for your tummy. Hansi, could you turn the water off again, please? Turn the How did Bonobo off, evolution please. get here, from here? Bonobos and chimpanzees live in Central Africa. But whereas chimpanzees range from rainforest to dry savanna, Bonobos are restricted to dense jungle virtually encircled by the arcuate course of the Congo River. Central Africa, Bonobo country, undisturbed so far by man. Until the 1970s, bonobos were not recognized as a species distinct from chimpanzees. They are smaller than chimpanzees and very gentle. Together, bonobos and chimpanzees are human beings' closest living relatives. Research into chimpanzees' language acquisition began years ago. Vicky, do this. Do this, Vicky. Do this. No, no, do this. That's fine. In 1947, American psychologists Keith and Catherine Hayes began teaching human speech to a young chimpanzee called Vicky. But after six years, Vicky could only produce barely intelligible renditions of Mama, Papa, and Cup. The Hayes showed that chimpanzees could not be taught to make human sounds. So in 1966, doctors Allen and Beatrix Gardner began using American Sign Language with their eight-month-old chimpanzee, Washoe. The thing that the chimps always had available to play with, dolls. Uh, they varied in how well they liked dolls. To signal more, Washoe puts her arms over her head. Washoe's early moors were made overhead, and this has also been reported for very young deaf children. Washoe learned 85 different signs, which greatly impressed researchers at the time. More. Within. Open. Open. The chimpanzees could talk back to us in that language because they, they, they are um, very capable in all their 
hand skills that they have in using their hands, and a visual language was one that we could use readily as a means of two-way communication. But a scientific paper published in 1979 refuted the results of the sign language method. The paper's author, Dr. Herbert Terrace of Columbia University. What I saw was that the chimp was more or less mirroring or shadowing the teacher signing. That the teacher would sign something to them and then would um, feed it back either the same sign or related sign or throw in a few general purpose signs. Terrace reached his conclusion after analyzing sign language used by his own chimpanzee research subjects. Discouraged, attempts to teach language to apes waned for a while. However, researchers at Georgia State pressed on. Austin's getting ready, Shelley. Dr. Savage Rumbau tried a method whereby apes could not imitate humans. Wearing headphones, the subject responds to a hidden questioner by selecting the appropriate photograph. Austin! Find the apple! Give it to Sue. He gave me kiwi, Shelly. Shelly says no. Wait, just wait. Just leave these there. Find the snake. The snake. Wrong again. All right, Austin, I need to listen through your headphones and see what it is. Austin has difficulty with headphones, but what if he can see the speaker? Austin, snake, snake. Very nice, Austin, very nice. Find the apple, the apple. Once more with headphones and once again, wrong. No, all right. Let, let me have your headphones and let me listen to Shelley. Now, what happens when Austin hears the question face to face? Apple, apple, apple. Very nice, Austin. In the end, the results of similar tests with Austin proved inconclusive. Then there's Kenzie. Does he really understand what he hears? Watching all right. Hansi, see if you can find mushrooms. Mushrooms. That's right, those are the mushrooms. Real good. Can you turn back around? Okay, now, now. Okay, you're doing real good, Hansi. See if you can find Madhu, the orangutan. You see Madhu? Good job. Good job. See if you can find some melon. 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 Thank you. See if you can find green beans. Green beans. Very nice. See if you can find a picture of soup. Soup. Very nice. Thank you. That's me. See if you can find a picture of Coconut, coconut. Good, good job. See if you can find a picture of oranges, oranges. You see a picture of oranges? Thank you very much, Hansi. See if you can find a picture of banana, banana. Very nice. And now we need uh, Pamanisha. Do you see Pamanisha? Another bonobo. Thank you. And now we need. Keys. Do you see the picture of keys? Thank you, Kanzi. And now we need... Obviously, Kanzi can choose correct pictures in response to Sue's voice. Oh, but how about other voices? Unseen voices? I don't have any more on my list. Kanzi, come on. We're all set. We're ready. With Dr. Rose Sevchik putting questions through a microphone, Kanzi takes the test that Austin failed.
Will Kanzi still be able to distinguish words? Kanzi, give Sue the picture of Jews. Kanzi, give Sue popsicles. That's right. Kanzi, give Sue bananas. That's right. Kanzi, give Sue ice. That's right. Kanzi, give Sue pears. Kanzi, give Sue potatoes. Kanzi has picked up several hundred words, not through formal training, but in daily life with Dr. Savage Rumba and others. Good. Good. 1980 was the year of Kanzi's birth into the Bonobo clan at the Language Research Center. He was less than a month old when this film was shot. Kanzi is the one being kissed by a nurturing female called Matata. In Bonobo society, infants are passed back and forth among adults. The whole community takes turns babysitting. But baby Kanzi was happiest with Matata. In the wild, adults lavish affection on the young. Matata was born in the wild. Perhaps that is why she is so fond of baby Kanzi, despite the fact that he is not her offspring. In the end, Kanzi was raised by Matata. Meanwhile, researchers were trying to teach Matata words without much success. She had baby Kanzi with her all the time, but they weren't teaching him. They thought him too little to learn. Then when Kanzi was about two and a half, the unexpected happened. He would say apple and chase. Then he would go over and pick up an apple and then look at the researcher with a smile on his face and start running around the room. So to everyone's surprise, they found that Kanzi was learning language while they were trying to teach his mother and paying no attention to Kanzi. What was happening was that he had been learning by listening to what people said and observing what they did, much as a human child might. Kanzi amazed his researchers. Apes had been taught language before, but he picked it up on his own. Go get your ball. Kanzi understands long sentences as well as words. He's no good with lists, but sentences present no problem. Sue dons a welder's mask to prevent him reading her expression. Put on my mask and we're going to try a, a sentence with Kanzi, okay? Can you, can you hear me, Kanzi? Give the doggy a shot. Pausing only to locate the hypodermic syringe, he uncaps it and... Good job. Okay, thank you. Put the key in the refrigerator. Good job. Thank you. Very nice. Okay. Take the chow outdoors. Good job. Thank you. What about objects he can't see? Go get the ball that's outdoors.
Very nice. Thank you, Kanzi. Kanzi, could you take off Sue's shoe? Could you take my shoe off, please? You might need to untie it. Sometimes Kanzi applies his own logic. Asked to put water on a carrot, he threw it outdoors. Chided by Sue, he pointed to the rain. The carrot was wet. Now you can take it off. It will come off now. Okay, he did a good job, Karen. All right. You want to take my sock off too? A vocabulary of 800 words confers basic English skills. Kanzi has several hundred. After work, relaxation. Kanzi likes nothing better than camping with Sue. The informal environment, so different from the laboratory, nurtures his skills. Look at all the stuff that's here for our campfire. Kenzie, I need you to break this stick for Sue, please. Good. Thank you. Still burning. Go harder. Oh, thank you, Kenzie. your job is to put some bread on the plates. On the plates, that's right. Get some more bread for our hamburgers and put it on the plates. Okay. In Swahili, Kanzi means buried treasure. True enough. Every passing day unearths another hidden talent. Kanzi, this is your plate. Here's your plate, Liz. You're happy. I'm very happy about this part. You got to put some water on the fire. Do you see the water? Good job. Time to go. Austin, I hear you saying, Austin. A return to home and in the truest sense, to Kenzie's family. In 1992, Kenzie's foster mother, Matata, gave birth to a child of her own. The baby's name is Nima. The film of Nima's birth shows Matata serving as her own midwife. Grasping her unborn infant by the head, she delivers it. Within moments, she draws the infant to her breast. A bonobo first on film. Nima, gaining size and strength with plastic barbells. Nima is the youngest of Matata's brood. Oldest is a seven-year-old female called Panbanisha. Panbanisha, like Kanzi, has excellent language skills. Matata's second offspring is Tamuli, the one being hit. For research purposes, Tamuli has had relatively little human contact. She doesn't understand English. Back to Kanzi, eager to go visiting. Hi, how are you, Kanzi? Did you want something? I don't like 
that. Keys. Keys. You need a key? Need a key, huh? I have some keys right here. Group room. Keys. You want to open that, huh? Keys. Matata. Good. Oh, you want a key to see Matata and you're going to be good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. Oh, that's so nice. Kenzie is no sooner through the door than he forgets his promise to be good. He takes Pan Banisha's ball. Pan Banisha is more demonstrative than Kenzie. As to losing her ball, never mind. It's her turn for a walk in the woods with Sue. Pan Banisha, like Kenzie, loves the woods. She takes Sue walking here just about every day. They stop to chat, using the speech board, which is never far away. Bug. Chase. Chase, Pan Benicia replies, demanding to be chased. Play chase is a part of their routine, but like a human child, Pan Benicia quickly tires. Carry. Yes. This too is part of the routine. Pan Banish's command of human language equals Kansi's. But she is strong-willed. Testing her skills is no easy task. Hey, Manisha, will you do something for Sue? Will you do something and for Sue? And then you'll chase her. And then I'll chase her? Yes. No. <laughs> Chase. Yeah. Yeah. Tell her, yes, she'll chase her, but you want her to do something yeah. for me, Ryan. But I want you to do something for Sue. Yeah, we're going to do some things, and then Ryan will chase you, okay, Pamanisha? Okay, give Pinky some apple. Oh, that was very good. Thank you, Pamanisha. Could you throw the kiwi? Good job, good job, thank you. You can have some jelly, it's all right. Let's go chase, Ryan. After work, playtime. For all young mammals, play is an important part of discovering, testing, and experiencing their world. But even humans don't learn to drive when they are seven like Pan Benicia. Oh, oh, yeah, there you go. Put that down. Bye! Oh, be careful, Pan Benicia. Careful! Pan Overexcitement can cause bad behavior such as jumping on the dog. Oh, Pan Benicia knows she's being scolded. Is this the face of Bonneville Contrition? Good. I hope so. Some milk. I know, you always want some milk when you're planning to be good. I like it. As if to a tone, Pan Benicia goes to pat the dog she jumped on.
this front ball. You want to throw front ball? And throw that ball. And throw that ball. Be careful. Woods are always full of wonderful new surprises. Perhaps even monsters. He's scaring Mary. The staff created a monster myth to keep Kanzi and Panbanisha out of places they shouldn't go. Look, there he is! As if they were children on Halloween. It's all lots of fun and scary. Panbanisha, he might see us. What's he doing in there? I told him he came up this morning and he's still here. Masks have always given their wearers an implicit power. They featured in almost every primal religion. Bonobos, as well as humans, feel the thrill of that power. Hermione, she's getting you. She's getting you with a monster mask. Humans and bonobos alike experience the thrill of chasing and of being okay. chased. Watch out, Linda, there's a gorilla out here. The power of suggestion. Panbanisha and Kanzi display a rare ability to understand events that they see by linking them to words. What happens when they have to rely on words alone? Janine, who used to work at the research center, makes a phone call. Let's get our cube. Does this voice belong to a person? Kanzi hasn't the slightest idea what to make of a voice he can't see. Kanzi, can you, can you tell Sue who this is? Tell Sue. Talk to Sue. Tell her who's on the phone. Hello? Hi, Sue. Kanzi's looking all around. Oh, he's, he's wondering where this person on the phone is. Kanzi has listened to a telephone before, but this time, they hope he'll reply by using his keyboard. Kanzi, Kanzi, somebody wants to talk to you on the phone. Somebody has something to say to you. You better listen. Sit down here and listen to what they say. Hi. Sit down right here. Kanzi, this is Janine. I'm just talking to you. Kanzi, I want to tell you something. Talk How impossible. Phone. Conversing with someone you can't see. He used the keyboard in response to the phone, and that's a first. Would you like any food? Tell me what food you'd like. Hmm. Surprise. So food surprise. Food <laughs> surprise. Well, Condi, would you like a juice or some uh, M&M's or some sugar cane? M&M's. M&M's? Do you like M&M's? Okay. Kanzi, is, is there any other food you'd like me to bring in the backpack? Oh. A ball? Okay, I'll I can bring you. a ball. I'm going to bring him to see you. Then Janine visited. Will Kanzi recognize the puzzling source of the telephone voice? And will he remember her words, conveying a promised surprise? Hello. Surprise. Yeah, you talked to me about a surprise on the phone. I did bring surprises in my backpack. Oh, this is the food surprise I brought for you. Mm -hmm. Time to like gummy bears, yes. Yeah. And remember what else we talked about? We talked about them and did I show you the m and m A whole big box full of M&M's. 
And there's one more. Uh, one more thing you talked about is very special. Do you remember? Can you remember what you talked about to bring in my backpack? Swap it. Oh. Yes, Conzi. Uh, yes, that's right. It's a ball. You're absolutely right. Though puzzled by the source of Janine's voice on the telephone, he appeared to remember what she had said. Kanzi had clear recall of a past event and of things that he could not immediately see, tasks demanding high intelligence. By example, Kanzi may be telling us it's three and a half million years since we parted company in Africa. But you humans didn't leave us apes so far behind, after all. <laughs> Video games. To win at these, children have to master complex rules. React with lightning speed to computer electronics. And they have to think ahead. Does Kanzi have those skills? It seems so. Mastering important rules, he started gobbling dots at once. Keep pulling, now you can get them. That's right. Be careful. Ooh. Red and yellow monsters are lethal, but a player can eat them and score when they turn blue. Rose helps Kenzie understand this complicated rule. Okay, now get the monsters. Get them. And take the cherries too. Now watch out, stay away from them now. Now you can chase them again. Time to chase them. Kenzie's movements became ever more skilled. Now you have to stay away, get away, run away, run. Oh, now we can chase him again. Go get him. Oh no! He may have lost that game, but research with Kanzi and his clan shows that bonobos are primates gifted with extraordinary intelligence. Ongoing research, it is hoped, will offer clues to our own evolution. Good, Kanz. Very good. Thank you so much. Three and a half million year old Lucy shows that hominids walked erect even then. This posture held the key to human development in more ways than one. Lucy's structure and bonobos Pan Peniscus, to use Kanzi's scientific name, have been carefully compared at the University of California. Dr. Adrian Zillman. It's amazing how similar Pan Peniscus is to Lucy, who's one of the early hominids that lived on Africa, in Africa about three and a half million years ago. If we look at their skeletons and compare them, they're very similar in brain size, they're very different, they're very similar in stature, uh, the length of the lower limbs, and fairly similar in overall body proportions. Zaire in Central Africa. A Japanese research team has been studying wild bonobos here since the mid-1970s. What bonobos make of humans, we can't say. But humans learned a lot about bonobos. For example, in the wild, they often walk upright. They walk like humans, with straight backs and arms swinging at their sides, taking obstacles like logs in stride.
Wild bonobos, like the ancient hominid Lucy, can walk upright for long distances, even in rough terrain. A vertical posture leaves hands free to do more important things. Being able to stand upright lets hands carry food, grasp weapons and hold tools. It also paves the way to the next generation of intelligence, the tool maker, man. A bonobo walks like this, essentially upright. Chimpanzees bend further forward, making long distance walking difficult. In modern man, the back is perfectly straight. A bonobo leans further forward than the ancient hominid Lucy, but even so, the bonobo resembles the hominid more closely than the chimpanzee does. If we compare their gait, the bonobo is certainly the closest ape to Lucy. Walking upright left apes hands free to develop new skills. Development didn't stop with hands. An erect posture made room in the throat for larger vocal cords. Tongues became freer to wag. Ah. E, U, E, O. By contrast, a chimpanzee's tongue has little space to move, preventing it making a range of sounds. With voice came language, with hands came tools, and the dawn of modern man. The place. Guinea, West Africa. Since the mid-70s, researchers have watched chimpanzees using stones to crack nuts. And not just any stone. They select rounded hammer stones, and the anvil often has a depression in the middle so that smooth nut shells don't roll off the edge and escape the hammer. The scene was played back to Kenzie, so he could watch the chimpanzee's work. Did he relate to the scene? Had he learned from it? Not to be bested by mere chimpanzees, the bonobo took to the woods. First, a plentiful supply of hazelnuts. The roar of planes taking off from Atlanta's airport poses the contrast. Above, the latest in human technology. Below, an ape cracking nuts with a rock. For Kanzi, the task is not much of a challenge. But surely a quantum leap separates just using a rock and making it into a tool. Dr. Nicholas Toff, an archaeologist from the University of Indiana, would survive very well in the Stone Age. An accomplished stone tool maker, it was Toff's idea to have Kanzi make a blade. He devised this food store, securely fastened by a rope. Tugging the rope does nothing to release the food. It's not going to come that way. You having trouble with your tool? Dr. Toth showed Kanzi how to take a stone in each hand and strike them together to make a tool. A skilled stone napper can quickly make a sharp flint blade by hand without resorting to force. But Kanzi chose a more energetic method. Whatever works, use it. Kanzi was soon sawing a rope. Mm -hmm. 
Perhaps we just witnessed a replay of untold similar moments in our own human prehistory. In a very interesting way, by his own innovation, he learned that by throwing one stone against another, he could easily fracture them and produce sharp edges. This is something we never showed him. He learned on his own. Just uh, a few months after Hansi started flaking stone, he learned to do this all by himself, by throwing one stone against another. So this may be showing us some glimmerings of the origins of stone technology in human evolution. On one occasion, demands imposed by three months of filming caused human and bonobo tempers to flare. The producers asked Sue to put sentences to Tamuli to see if Kanzi would explain them to her. But Tamuli, who does not understand language, became frustrated. She began kicking Sue. Pound for pound, apes are five times as strong as humans. Even Tamuli is stronger than Sue, let alone Kanzi. With Sue trying to convey that she had misbehaved, Tamuli sought Kanzi's help. To his credit, Kanzi tried to arbitrate, keeping them apart. Tamuli is still unrepentant, and Sue? I'm not going to have it! Kanzi stepped between them, mediating with his bulk but the storm was almost spent. Tamuli sat down and offered an apology. Sue, badly bruised, was mollified. Peace was restored. Removed from the compound this time, Sue tried again to involve Tamuli in conversation, and the Bonobo's reaction was very different. For one thing, she no longer seemed to feel frustrated and inadequate. For another, her big brother, Kanzi, tried to explain. Tamuli, look here. Tamuli, could you slap Kanzi? Tamuli, you. Slap Kanzi. You slap Kanzi. By example, Kanzi tried to teach Tamuli the meaning of the words. Tamuli, could you give Kanzi a hug? <laughs> Tamuli, could you groom Kanzi? He's asking you to groom him. Look, he put your hand up there. Isn't that nice? Go ahead, groom Kanzi. Look, he's showing you. Well, here, you go ahead. You take that one little butt. Here, Kanzi. Thank you for showing Tamuli. Many people say that only humans teach each other this way, but Kanzi appears to be trying to show his little sister what to do. Dr. Savage Rumbaugh writes of her work. With regard to their social behavior and group structure, bonobos were more like human beings than other living apes. At times, she writes, I seem to be staring into my own distant past and seeing quasi-persons. They were not people, but near people. As I watch bonobos even today, I cannot but sense that I am in the presence of the emergence of the human mind. Kanzi, buried treasure in Swahili. Not a month goes by without Kanzi revealing another facet of his character to those who know him best.
Kanzi, Buried Treasure, promises to teach us much, much more about the journey of the human species from its ancient bones and shadows in the storied land of apes. Kanzi will return. <laughs>